following interview was conducted with uh, Patrick Del Castro for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, June the 20th, 2007, in the Dean's Commons Room. Uh, the interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and growing up in early years. Oh, okay. The truth, I was born in Italy, in Calabria, Italy, southern Italy. And I came to this country when I was seven years old. My father was already here, and we came, four of us, three of us came uh, as a family, including my mother, and we settled in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And that's where I got my elementary education, my secondary education, and my college education at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And so that that's, that's uh, uh, I don't know if you want any, you know, I, I mean, I can keep on going. Well, did you do, why did you go to college there too? I went to a BS degree only in, in but I got my PhD uh, master's first and a PhD at Purdue University. What made you decide to, uh, to come to Purdue? There it is. <laughs> well, rather than stay on in, in, in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, tell the truth, I didn't know the word Purdue meant when I saw it on the football uh, lineup. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, I was after I graduated from Duquesne, uh, the war was already on for a year. This is World War II. World War II. Okay. And so the, they let me finish, and I finished in May of 1942. They gave me a few months, and then they took me as a soldier in the United States Army. And I, it wasn't very long when I was a soldier with a rifle in my hand, a bayonet, and learning how to hate and learning how to kill. And the army is very clever in doing that. Then they decided to give me some pharmaceutical duties because they knew I was a pharmacist. So with a, this combat, same combat division what I was in, I was working uh, as a pharmacist. Was, we were in training in Colorado, learning how to f fight and kill in cold weather. So we we mainly practiced up there on the mountains near Pike Peak, in the snow, sleep in the snow, and things things like that. And then, and then uh, I was transferred to a hospital unit as a pharmacist, and I, I was, went overseas. So I worked as a pharmacist at a hospital in London, near London, Swindon Wilts. And then we went to Paris. As soon as Paris fell, we went to Paris, and we set up a hospital there. And I was there for one year working as a pharmacist, and we received the first patients during world during the Battle of the Bulge we were one we were, we were the one of the first hospitals to ever start using penicillin I have a lot of stories about penicillin which I tell my students in my history of pharmacy course then I was discharged in 1945 after the war was after the war was over yeah we were on our way to Japan when the atomic bomb dropped and then we were stuck in a place with nothing to do in in, nor in uh, western uh, France, and and so we had to wait until it was our turn to go home. And I got to go home in January of 1945. And I immediately got a job working as a community pharmacist for the Walgreen Company. And and uh, I, I wanted to learn how to make money because I always dreamed of having a big sign on my door, Bel Castro's Pharmacy. It didn't happen. Uh, during that year, that year that I was working for the Walgreen Company, the pharmaceutical convention was being held in Pittsburgh. And I wanted to know what they did at a convention. And so I went to, went to the hotel and looked around in the lobby. And I saw the dean of the School of Pharmacy at Duquesne, who was a great friend of mine and did a lot for me when I was a student at, at Duquesne. And he came up to me, he was talking to two deans, he introduced me, and then he excused himself, and went, we went, sat, sat down, and he says, what are you doing? I'm working for the Walgreen Company. He says, how would you like to work for me? I didn't even know what he meant. He says, I want you to teach courses for me in pharmacy, 
you'll assist me in my organic chemistry course, and then you'll teach two or three other courses, and school starts in two weeks. Here I am with a ba I said yes. Well, you got your bachelor's in pharmacy? Yeah, I had a bachelor's at that point. Yeah. And I, and, and, you know, under him, you know. And, and so then, then I, um, I thought that, uh, yeah, I, I did three years of teaching there. I took a couple of graduate courses. And then I realized for the first time that there was no future with a bachelor's degree in a university and be a teacher. And, and so I asked the dean if I could resign and go to graduate school. And he, he encouraged me to do that. And so in the meantime, in the graduate course that I've taken, I met a friend of mine who was also from Pittsburgh and his father owned five stores. And he was interested in graduate work and we took graduate courses together. But he, after a year he left, I kept on teaching for two years. He came to Purdue, this is school he selected for his graduate work. So when I finished, I did my shop in Iran and visited four or five other universities, but I chose Purdue. I came to Purdue in 1949. I was here as a graduate student for about four years. And then I was drafted into going to Ohio State. I had a teacher there that knew me, called me up and says, we need you here as a teacher. So with my PhD, I went to Ohio State and I taught there for two years. I was kind of miserable, I wasn't happy there. But this, like, came from God. Phone call came from Dean Jenkins. He says, Pat, we know your strength, and we want you to come down and teach at Purdue. He says, we want you to be mainly an undergraduate teacher, but you can do any much, much research as you, as you want to do. I said, that's fine. And so I came here then in, in 1954 as a PhD assistant professor, and I've been here ever since, and I you know, went through the tenure track and all, all that thing. And that, that's how I first got associated with, with Purdue, Purdue University. Okay. Right. So your career path was coming to Purdue. Now the School of Pharmacy, of course, it started a long time ago at the college. Yes, 1884. That's right. And they had some, a lot of the departments, and the first year under it was in, um, first full year in fall of 63 when they got the name of the College of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. Yes, I, I don't have all these dates in my head as to when it was changed. I know the reasons why it was changed. It was really, it's really Pharmacal Sciences. Dean Jenkins liked shorter words. We were known as the School of, Ph School of Pharmacy before that. Right. He wanted to emphasize to the world that we were a graduate school and that we were specialists in the pharmaceutical sciences. He didn't like the word pharmaceutical because it was associated with the pharmaceutical industry, so he changed the word to pharmacal, and that's how we got the name of the school. It was Dean Jenkins strictly who had that idea. Dean Jenkins is the one that invited you to come. Was he the dean when you came? He's the one that invited me to come here and be, and be a faculty member. And he knew me when I was a student here, you see. And then uh, over time it's changed, but particularly in fall of 1999 is when the new six-year program came in for the PharmD. Uh, approximately, no, but, but don't forget, we had a five-year, we had a four-year program when I first came here. That's right. With and Dean then we had a five-year program started in 1960. That was the freshman class who graduated the first class in 1965. And Dean Jenkins was absolutely against the five-year program. Uh, and he would have been deadly before it was a four. Before it was a four. It, it wasn't that he didn't believe in more education. It was that, you see, we make our money here, I mean, <laughs> with uh, grants and PA, our, we, 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 we used to turn out more PhDs than any pharmacy school in the country. I think we were pretty close to doing that, still doing that now. So the, 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 uh, the health of the School of Pharmacy and graduate work depends on our bachelor's students who go for the PhD. Because people like me right now, I'm a PhD and I have a degree in pharmacy. I'm getting extinct because very few people today, and even under the five-year program, but less today than there were under the five-year, will want to sacrifice the the time that it takes to get a PhD. Number one, five years 
under the five-year plan, they still have their way paid. All graduate students in our school, I mean, are, are financed. But we got some. To date, or six years, and they want to go. They have to go five for a PhD. They start at ninety thousand dollars per year when they graduate from here after six years. And sixty-two percent of our students are women, and they're age twenty-four. They're thinking about marriage. They're thinking about settling down a home. They're not going to go, at, they tell me right to my face, why should I be a professor like you and give up a half a million dollars uh, in wages? What will I make when I, when I get the PhD? Not much more, maybe less than I'm making now. And so we have engineers, biologists, uh, biochemists who are going for the PhD, and those are becoming the, the teachers and the researchers in, this, uh, you know, in pharmacy. With the PhD, you could go more to research if the companies would they prefer if someone had a PhD the doctor? Oh, yeah. if, if you don't have a PhD in industry, you, mean, you can work for them, but, but you don't make very much money or get much recognition. Okay. To discovery, the idea of discovery and development. We, we, we're in industrial pharmacy, it's my department. We teach students how to develop drugs. The chemist, they teach the students how to invent and think about which drugs may be good for a particular disease. And then we develop into those dosage forms that a patient can swallow, sw uh, be injected with or anything. Going back again, why did, what was the, uh, the thoughts behind going to the six year? Okay. The for the researchers, because the, the program, is, that, that's a pretty long, and that includes the 44, yeah. uh, well, the clinical. The, 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 we're call, also called clinical pharmacists, our graduates, you see. The profession, went with certain emphasis. At one time it was chemical, then biological, with pharmacology being emphasized. Now it's getting more clinical, social, patient. The reason is that we lost our compounding functions. When I worked in the drugstore, 90% of the prescriptions I filled were compounded. Right. I am the suppository maker, the pill roller, and this is what I taught students to do. That's almost, not 100%, but it's almost lost. So our students lost their original function, and, and, and the profession moves towards the counseling, advising of patients and the proper use of drugs. To do that, you've got to almost be trained like a doctor. And so they've increased the therapeutics courses, the pharmacology, the biochemistry, and, and then they have one year in that six years. One year is completely out in the field with them paying the tuition, learning in a drugstore, in a hospital, how to deal with patients and diseases and so forth. Where do most of the graduates, uh, one thing that I read, um, Pat, said that there's a more openings than there are pharmacists. Is that true for the... There's a shortage of pharmacists in Indiana. The women have goofed up things, you see, 62% women. They stop to have a family. And so it's hard to come up with a replacement factor to the pharmacy. So as a result, you never, you can't predict when a woman is coming back or whatever. So as a result, we're losing those people, you know, as regular people. And as a result, there's a great demand all over the United States for pharmacists. Where is the placement? Are some of them going into pharmacies? in the hospitals, and you're talking about more of the health, the counseling thing, so the hospitals... Sixty percent of our students will go into a chain, like like uh, CBS, Walgreens, and so forth. The rest of them will go into a hospital. A few will go into other uh, various fields, go organizational work and things like that. Do any of them go into government? Yeah, that's right. Military, the public health service, so there's a, a mislead. And a few, a few will go to graduate school. We also have a program where a student can go four years here and get a bachelor's degree in, in uh, pharmaceutical sciences, but it's not a PhD. We did that deliberately to open up the door for them to go directly for the PhD, but only a few do. But they can get a job in industry and do very well assisting a PhD uh, when they develop the drugs, because they, they're usually the best students we have in the class. Okay. Uh, I know you 
talked about teaching. I've got a couple things. Your interaction with students and any some tips on teaching and, and your feelings after all this time in the classroom, some of the things. Say that again. On, you know, working with the students, interaction with the students, yeah. and some tips on teaching some of the things that you've learned over time in oh, your yeah. career. Oh, yeah. I mean, I love, I love, I love to teach students. I mean, that, that, that's that's my forte, and and therefore I had a great time teaching my my courses when I taught them. I've taught ten different courses here, thirteen in my career. See, there was a time here, even at Purdue, when when we we only had, when I started, we only had twenty two PhDs, and we're teaching a lot of courses. So each one had a two or three. I taught as many as four courses in one semester. Average two, but a lot of times three, and sometimes four. So, so uh, I enjoy the teaching part. There's no money in it. You got to do research here. And I brought, I've turned out a few PhDs also, but the strength is in getting the grants and and uh, and turning out the research, and, and 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 that's that's the area where we're strongest in the school of pharmacy. Mm-hmm. And of course, uh, talking about. Diversity in the school. In '75, we had that uh, farm, the pharmacy education program. Now you have the Student National Pharmaceutical Association, but you had a lot of programs to encourage uh, the underrepresented or the to, to in, increase diversity within the school. We're, we, you, we're doing a lot to help encourage students to do something different than going into the retail store. It's tough to compete with ninety thousand dollars a year. It's tough to compete. Yes. And even, even well, there's a there's a foundation that we have that supports graduate students and undergrad. That foundation is trying awfully hard to say to an undergraduate student, "Here's three thousand dollars for you." Yeah. What foundation is that? Something. This like American it. Foundation for Pharmaceutical Education. They'll take a, a these these people are called the bachelors in pharmaceutical sciences or the or the PharmDs, and they'll say, "Come and." Do a little research at Purdue. We'll pay you three, four thousand dollars for the summer, and and we want you to learn how to do research. They come and they accept the money, but after they're through, they go out and work for that ninety-two thousand. You you've also done some programs with, for the undergrads, similar to what a lot of the schools are doing. Encourage undergrads to come and work with the faculty during the summer. Are they still doing that? Yes. Undergrad research. We have. Well, I just met one the other day. We have an undergraduate student right within our own school. You know. And she she has no intention of ever practicing pharmacy, and and she's working under Dr. Taylor, and she's enjoying the creative part. They give them they give them a lot of routine work to do, see, and that's what they don't like. They mean they they, they see the creative process, but they're also in that lab working and creating data for the for the for the professor. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Uh, I had something on enrollment, but enrollment has increased over time in the school. Oh yeah, and well. Is ranked up there about the uh, fourth in the nation. The pharmacy school is ranked pretty high. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's not related to it's not related to uh, to enrollment. It's mainly our graduate work carries up. But we have a good undergraduate uh, program. The the enrollment is now we accept uh, 160 and 20 people in the area of, uh, I told you, they could go bachelor's degree in pharmaceutical sciences with four years. We accept about 20, 20 to 30 of, the, of those students, because they're part of our school, you see. And, and, and so, but the enrollment right now is 160. If you want to count those other 20, okay, but they're not really going to be pharmacists, those other 20 students. And so, otherwise, when I came here, it was only 120 when I started to work here. Then it went to 140, and then when we started the, the farm day, it went to 160. So, see, we, didn't, we don't have the space in the lab, the labs to accommodate more people. I mean, if you have a lab and you have a 40 people in the lab, there's five days in the week, you know, it's pretty hard to, 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 to work them in, in space, lectures. But you have it uh, modernized the facilities over time because it got kind of cramped over there. We've probably remodeled the whole building, sure. but space-wise, it's about the same. We moved in that building in 1970. Right, that's when we had the big dedication. Yeah, that's yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. Um, but we've talked, we've touched a little bit about graduate education, and some of them are not necessarily going on now that they have your six-year program. Then they go on and practice, don't they? Rather than unless they want to go into research and maybe work for a pharmaceutical company, they probably should have a PhD. 
to, to work for a pharmaceutical company or to, or, or to work as a teacher, a professor, you've got to have a PhD. If you want to get into the research process, uh, pharmaceutical industry will accept a person like the BS in pharmaceutical sciences, but they're not going to be developing, they're not going to be the minds developing the drugs. They're going to be assisting someone because that's the way, that's the way, and in, in teaching it's almost impossible. We have a few people in our building with a master's degree, but Dean, Dean Tyler would not accept the farm D for years because he could never get them promoted. Then we got a special group on this kind of farm D would have been just a four year or five year? No, no, farm D, yeah, at that time was, was a, we had an optional farm D, the five year or an optional farm D for six years, you see. And, and, and those, those students, those students who uh, opted for the, for the farm D, you know, they, 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 they did pretty well. Uh, but unless, unless you have a PhD, uh, it's hard to do it in teaching. And you, you know, it's hard to get accredited if you don't have so many PhDs on your faculty. Because that's what the accrediting agency, that's one of the criteria. That's right. That's right, when you come right. down, that's right. But some of them are going... See, the Farm D doesn't have any training in the research, in the scientific method. And that's what's needed. Right. And that's what the PhD does. Do you bring in, uh, are a lot of your students both within the United States and outside? Do you have many in your We have a certain proportion. I think 25% are out of state of our students. So that's a pretty good percentage of the people with, uh, the coming from within Indiana. Oh, they yeah. Only have the we're, we're almost obligated to do that. You know, because of tax-paying institution. Sure, but some, and then you get. But for, wait, wait a minute. Now, for the graduate school, that doesn't hold. Okay. We'll take them from anywhere. To the truth, I'm, in my department, we have 30 graduate students. 24 of them are Asians. It gives you an idea that we cannot get Americans, and especially pharmacists, to go for the. What, what other changes have been, uh, you've worked under, I talk a little bit about your deans, you had several deans there. And yeah, I, wor I worked under Dean Jenkins first, he's the right. one that hired me, and uh, he, he was a great, he had a great business mind, and he ran the school very, like a tight ship, uh, thinking always of money. He, when he retired, they mentioned publicly that his, uh, dinner that he never went over budget and he was very strict with the money unless you had a function at a meeting he would not want he didn't want to pay your way he forced you to do something so that that so that you could earn your way to the meeting so he was that that kind of a guy and he was uh, we didn't have departments under him everybody worked for him we didn't have we only have 20 20 some faculty members and we didn't have departments. Only when he, then the, uh, we got, Tyler was hired, but he didn't report for almost a year, and during that year, Jenkins departmentalized the school. It was a dirty trick on Tyler, but he, that, that, that's what happened. Got the department lined up, in other words. Because the, Dean, Dean Tyler should have had a say so on who became a department. Head. So, so then, then Tyler came, came in, for a long period of time, 20 years. Yeah, he was here from 66. Of course, he was vice president. Uh, but he, stayed, he moved on in 86. Oh, yeah. Exactly yeah. Right, but he was the dean of the school for 20 years. That's right. He was time. dean of the school, and uh, he had a different different style of, uh, of, of the tell you the truth, he micromanaged a lot at uh, uh, the school. And so, uh, so the department heads lost some of their power, I think. But... They, they, they all uh, put up with it, and, and it, it, it didn't matter. But Did it, it, it doubled, under him, under Tyler, it, uh, he doubled, we doubled the number of faculty, more than doubled the number of faculty, and, and we more than doubled the number of graduate students that we had in school. Mm -hmm. So he hired people that could bring in money. Research money. Research money right. and grantmanship. And he, brought in, and he brought in three people right away from Europe, from Germany. He brought in three people who were, we did great here, see. And so, and then he, 
became the vice president, I'm, I'm not. I'm leaving out a lot of deeds. I don't want to get into dirty laundry or anything like that. Were there any uh, during that tenure? Were there many curriculum changes? Mean, were there many changes in the schools that he brought along? The five-year program started in 1960. Tyler took over in 1966, so a year after our first class. But then Tyler began the clinical movement. He could see that compounding was not going to. Okay. So he he pushed the clinical program very, very strongly, he and two other faculty members. But it was so idealistic. And by the way, they're still pushing it. It hasn't caught hold. You know why? Because the pharmacist wants paid for giving advice, just as well, if you have diabetes, you go to a hospital and you spend an hour with a dietitian, you spend an hour with a person who teaches you how to, how to pierce your, your blood out of your finger, and they get paid $150 for that hour. They will not pay a pharmacist for the counseling. They're starting to, but here it is, over 35, 40 years later, and they're having a hard. The, the, the insurance companies don't want to pay the pharmacist for it, and, and hospital, the doctors are very jealous. They don't want to give up, uh, give them any rights to it, you know, to, Something with their they be doing, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so exactly. It, it's a it's a tough area, and the pharmacist end up filling prescriptions, and they don't mind making that money. <laughs> Speaking of pharmacies, as the School of Pharmacy, have you always had a pharmacy over there? It's been for a long time. You know, you have your pharmacy over there in the school. Yeah, yeah. Has that been there? Since before? I've been here, that, that, pharma some that pharmacy was there, and it gave students practice. Yes, it's, it's, it's been there. Yeah. Is it only available, not to the community, can the community use that pharmacy? Or no, only the, students and, and our own pharmacy faculty. Now, Tyler tried to open it up. You mean I can't, I can't use it? Okay. So it's just a pharmacy. pharmacy. He wanted the, all the faculty here to have access. But Nora Bart went to the governor and stopped it. Remember Nor? you know Nora Bart? And in a way, it was it was really right because if you open it up, you see they give it does, they give the students a discount. They give our fac pharmacy faculty a discount, and it would it would yeah. look Norbert is no longer in business because he he had to compete with the chains and he couldn't compete. Just like Wells Fargo Bass. That's right. Look at that. CVS that's the oldest store in the city. Yeah, I know that's right. Well, then. Um, after Tyler, so you were here when Dr. Rutledge took over? After yeah, I was here when Dr. Rutledge took over. Sure. I didn't have much to do with them. Uh, I, me, Tom, I retired in 90, but because they, 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 they uh, hired me, I wasn't. I didn't make very much money. I, I told them I didn't want any money, but they had to give me some money for insurance purposes. And so I, I kept teaching my history of pharmacy, and I really had no other function in the school at all. When, uh, when you were on the faculty, Serve in it. Were you in the Senate at any time? Any university committees? Well, we had we instead of the Senate at that time, we had the um, geez, there was another name before before the Senate. The university Senate Executive Committee or something. But I, and I was on that for, sure. for three or four four years, mm -hmm. and I uh, served on committees on campus. I was on the Student Affairs Committee, and I was a chairman of the committee to get it a new director of libraries. And I, and I was chairman of the library committee also, and I was on the library committee for seven years. For many of those years, I was chairman of that, that committee. And then I automatically became chairman. When I was chairman of that committee, I became chairman of the committee to get a new director of libraries, and I brought Danyezi here. Uh, you know, were you here then? If so you know. Ann Kirker was on that committee too. That's like correct. That's, that's correct. correct. Yes, exactly. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And I gave. I gave uh, the dean, the current dean here, details about how we chose Danese and, and things like that. It, it was a difficult job. Uh, by the way, it was one of the most difficult things that, that I did. Because didn't, you, didn't someone accept and then you oh, yeah. all over again? Oh, yeah. The, 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 you know, you know, we interviewed and, and interviewed 10 people. And the university was... That was long. It was a long... Earth, two years. Yeah, right. You know, when, uh, when I took, left shortly after I came. When I took over that committee, the 
university called me in the, in the office with Hawkins and called in. He says, Pat, we want you to get the best librarian on this for this campus, the best. You have unlimited funds. We'll pay anything. And I, I did go for the top people. And and they, some of the top people came here. They didn't want the job. They didn't want the job. And and then we and it see we had to have a PhD. That's what they wanted. They felt that only a PhD could understand the the scientific method and the literature that's required to support people who are doing scientific research, especially in engineering. Then they feel that the average librarian knew, because there was a lot of conflict between the administration and the library, and the librarian who was a chief of library who was here at that time, you know, uh, before before the, the cover gal took over, or before Dan, before Danese, before Danese. Well, Moriarty was here. Moriarty. Yeah. He, re he retired shortly after I came. There was a lot of problems uh, between the university and the librarians and and and, and, and 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 the and I was on the committee. I was on the library committee at that time. When Moriarty was here, probably when Moriarty was the director. Yeah, oh. yeah. I was chairman of the. And it was Moriarty's last few years here. See, so so I knew all the problems that were going on because I I I, I don't know if I we should go on. Right. That's all right. You just run the committee. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, the, the, but but it it, uh, it worked out well after that because then I I start getting a, a a I got the master's degree and I got Danese from MIT and he was a very good librarian I don't care about his personal life but but he he did did a good job as a librarian right, exactly uh, let's we're going to change the pace a little bit the village how has that changed I usually ask people since you've been here a number of years. How has that changed? She will. We used to have a post office down there. And Nora Bart owned a store down there. And uh, there were very few places you could eat. <laughs> In fact, when I first came here as a student, there was one restaurant there that would not serve blacks. And the students boycotted it, and then they finally had to change their mind. What was housing like when you came for faculty? When you came, what was housing like when you came? Was it... The university was would not admit a student if they didn't have a bed for him. That is undergraduate. Graduate students, you have to find your own, your own. They didn't have any, but they had a married student's courts at, at that time. But for single graduate students, they didn't have anything for them. And uh, I had a room in, in someone's home. Uh, there were very few apartments available. What about faculty housing when, when you became when his faculty? Was well, the, the university, it was, things were so bad that the university then opened up a, 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 resi, a hall of temporary houses for one year for new faculty. They also, they also used to have faculty in those apartments north of Owen Hall, uh, where Owen Hall has the apartments now. They, they used to call them the bricks. Yeah. So, so faculty lived there for one year, or they lived in a home where the sorority fraternities are now, and, and up, uh, up on the hill. And otherwise, uh, it was tough. The, the university was responsible for getting someone of it. So housing was very, very it's difficult. Very tight, yeah. In fact, there was a time when a, a Japanese person could not own a home in West Lafayette. Oh, that is tight. Uh, how about continuing the education for pharmacists? The school used to have some of those programs. Do they still have that continuing education? Well, for the, they still offer. We those? were we really doing it. It's bringing in a lot of money. Uh, we needed uh, some of the things that I read said that they want to increase that or to have it because you need certification. Okay. That school has other schools. Uh, see, continuing days. education is now a requirement. It wasn't so when I was a pharmacist. But now it's a re if you want to, re you have to renew your license every year. And to renew that license, you have to show that you have improved your knowledge by only proving that you've attended so many lectures, so many hours, or read so many articles to improve your pharmacy education. That's all you have to do today. But we do that through tapes. We sell tapes. We have courses, uh, videotapes that students
students can buy and listen to the lecture and meet the requirement for the State Board of Pharmacy for their continuing, and that's a very lucrative uh, market uh, right States now. States are a lot way better way to go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, any act, what, tell me about your activities since your official retirement. I think you addressed that a few moments ago. You continue teaching. Anything else? Yeah, I've, been, I've been teaching, and, and uh, my wife is Danish, and so during the summers, we always, I think we've been over there 26 times to visit her relatives. <laughs> we went over to Denmark, Copenhagen, and my wife is from the Faroe Islands, which is way, way north near Iceland. Where did you meet your wife when you were at Purdue? Copenhagen. I was a, on sabbatical. Uh, and and uh, I see what I did. In 1959, I decided to take a sabbatical. And, uh, and so I, I visited eight countries in 30 days. And in each country, I visited the pharmacy school. And, and, uh, and I chose the University of Copenhagen because they uh, liked me. I liked them. They financed it. Uh, with supplies and equipment, and I liked what they were doing, and it was great. And, and as you know, 60, you asked me how I met my wife. Huh? You, you, as you know, the 98% the, the of Danes are Lutheran. And so I went to Catholic Church one Sunday uh, in March 18, big exact. <laughs> and I sat next to this lady next to me, young girl and she could see that I was bored because the mass was in Danish so she shared her missile you're Catholic aren't you? yeah she shared her missile with me and in the missile there was a little card that says prayer for nurses I thought she was an English speaking nurse and I thought it was so kind that she would do that you know so I followed her out after church and I invited her for breakfast she accepted. I invited her for dinner two, th three days later, and she accepted. A year later, I married her. Is she a nurse? She is. Oh, okay. So that she came to this country, and she was she was very, very successful. She learned the language so fast. She took a driver's edu education course here at Purdue. They used to have a driver education course, and she learned how to drive right away. And then after the kids grew up, her nursing degree was out of tune. You know what she did? She enrolled in a school of nursing and got a degree in nursing from Purdue University. Oh, very and then she started, and then she worked at the home hospital for eight years. You have children? Do you have a We have two children. I have a daughter who is uh, 42 years old, and I have a son 40 years old. And my daughter is a very successful human being. She's in upper management with a big company California. My son is a computer technician for 50 professors at the University of Indiana uh, at Bloomington, Indiana. Yeah, he got a, he got a, we're all graduates from Purdue. He got a bachelor's degree in English. That's about all he could major in because he was on drugs during his uh, younger days and he wasn't qualified to even go to college because he didn't have much of a high school education. But he he could all, filled all the requirements. He's doing very, very well right now. Good. Neither one are married. So you kept pretty busy. Now, how about an, outst uh, an outstanding event in your life? Can you think of that or a favorite memory of Purdue? Favorite uh, memories at Purdue? Mm -hmm. You mean about the campus? and Any favorite memory of Purdue? Yeah. You well, I'd like to share that with us. <laughs> the, the, the place has changed. Uh, quite a bit, in, you know, when I, when I think of how small it was, when I think the area right here, outside here, was all trees and had a path diagonally going through, uh, uh, it, that, that has changed a lot. The attitudes of students have changed a lot. Grades have inflated a lot uh, since, since I've been here, and, and uh, professors don't dress like they used to here. They mean, it's a most informal. But when I lecture, I hear, and no matter what, I always wear my necktie and my and my coat, and I'm walking along campus, and people look at me as if I was from outer space. And my, I have to explain this to the students in class why I'm dressed up. The professional attitude, which I learned under the dean at, 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 at Duquesne. <laughs> 
and and um, the the uh, the faculty has changed a lot, uh, and and uh, the the people are a little bit more liberal than they are now. I remember when uh, the, the marriage course, my God, the teacher had to be very careful what he said. He couldn't talk about sex. Now they show a movie on how to have sex in the in the in the marriage course and have a sex course separately. And and um, uh, if I had to say the the the, uh, the thing that stands out the most. It's probably the change in students. I think it's a little harder to deal with students today than it was in those days. Um, Were you ever a fat fellow at all? I have been a fat. I just resigned after 45 years. Where? What? Uh, Owen Hall. The only reason I resigned again, the how these established the pharmacy fellows program, the uh, faculty, faculty fellows because there was a lack of communication between undergraduate students and faculty. And it was a terrific idea. John Christian and his wife were the ones who were the hub and the heart of that whole movement. And and, uh, and, and it was good for, stu for students, to, for us to go over there and eat with them every week. Family could go as well, the children could go. And yeah, and, and I, I, learned, I did this and, and, and helped it was a good missionary opportunity to do some good to st for students, and I've helped lots of students very privately uh, without anyone knowing anything about it. But now I don't think that's true anymore. I read in the New York Times that a student w will miss a class and send an email to his professor and say, would you please give me a copy of your notes, or please send me an outline of what you covered today. I mean, it's, it's not bashful at all. Uh, they didn't say, why did I, you know. Uh, and, and so, also, we used to eat family style almost at, at the halls. But now, all one closed, uh, their, hall, their cafeteria, and a couple of others, and Carrie, and so they got this board. And I go over there. I've been eating there all this last year. Uh, With the students from all in that you get. But see, the students have the freedom now to eat on any hall. In fact, they can go eat at the Union at 6 o'clock at night if they want to. Okay. All they need is their ID. And they have their own life. They're not going to be stimulated to go eat with a faculty fellow on, set, on, Friday, on Thursday when we come. As a result, uh, it's the number of students that are eating with a faculty fellow is dwindling down. I only had around 10 students eat, eat with me all last year. It's been a good program. I, um, I've i been involved with the Tarkington program. Of course, it helps a little bit because they still have their eating facilities. They have yeah. that, yeah. Yeah, they've yeah. built, and that, that does make a difference. Uh, and also, but also what helps is the contact with the RA on the floor. The kind oh, of yeah. People line up. I mean, that, now, know, that, that person ate with me every week. Right. But you know what she did? She was very conscientious. When we came, my wife and I came, she would go, before we came, she'd go from room to room and beg a student to eat with her. I says, please don't do that. I says, I think, I don't want to interfere with a student's life. If he has something else to do, he should have the freedom to go into it. Uh, anything, in summary, anything that I haven't asked that you'd like to share with us or any closing comments? Um, you can think of. Well, I I think that the, you mean about the, uh, anything okay. in general have to do with your career yeah. or university or I asked you you gave us some perfect memories any outstanding event or just some general uh, or something that I didn't ask that you want would like to share that I might have not asked. I I tell the truth I I have no complaints at all uh, regarding me and I'm. I'm I feel very fortunate, you know, that I came here uh, to Purdue University. It was, uh, it was uh, having been in a Catholic institution for such a long, uh, you know, as a, as a teacher and as a student, and I came here and it all opened up a whole new world for me, including seeing my first cow when I came here. <laughs> and and uh, as a result, uh, 
I, 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 I really feel that I'm, I, I feel very grateful that I was exposed to this kind of an institution to the point where even though I swore in a stack of Bibles that I would go back and support Catholic education, I never did, I never did go back. Uh, it was hard to leave the luxury and the facilities that were here and go back to another institution. So uh, I have nothing negative. Uh, oh, you know, Purdue has its faults, and and uh, you, President Hobbs used to share some of his some of his frustrations with me when he was a speaker at AUP. I was very active in AUP, uh, and he really had his complaints about the faculty, and he used to tell me about them. Uh, but every school will have their weaknesses and their strengths, and I think as a whole, Purdue has done very well. I'd say it's a very the only criticism I would have is it's a very conservative university compared to other universities. And it bothers many people who come here, especially from the East. But maybe this female president that we got coming up, I have a feeling things are going to change quite a bit when she gets here. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think this concludes it. Thank you.